동일한 역사를 가진 우리는 왜 다른 길을 걷게 됐을까요? 전혀 다른 체제의 두 나라는 어떻게 경제 대국이 됐을까요? 왜 어떤 나라는 부유하고 왜 어떤 나라는 가난할까요? Welcome to We d a e h a n Swap Great Minds. I am Darna Samoglu, an Institute Professor of Economics at MIT. In this lecture, I will talk about why some countries have much higher levels of income and prosperity than others. The main ideas will draw from my book co-authored with James Robinson, Why Nations Fail. In this book, we try to develop a theory of the long-run causes of poverty and prosperity, which I'm looking forward to sharing with you. We live in a globalized, unified, connected world. Telephones, the internet, social media have created a world which is very close even though when we are separated by thousands of miles. In such a world, it's normal to expect that the best practices will spread from country to country and whatever works for the economy, for the prosperity of the people, most nations will emulate and adopt. But in fact, The reality is very different. Many of you may already be aware that we live in a world of inequities. Not only is there a huge gulf between rich and poor within a nation, such as South Korea or the United States, but the gaps that separate countries are truly astounding. The richest countries in the world today, those in the United States, like such as the United States or Western Europe, have 50 times the income per capita, average income, that some of the poorest nations have. Such gulfs that exist between rich and poor nations are truly mind-boggling. When philosophers started writing about the economy in the 18th century, for example, they lived in a world that had much less inequality than the one today. For example, the field of economics in some ways was founded by Adam Smith, writing in the middle of the 18th century. And Adam Smith's ambition was to understand how the economy worked, but also provide answers about why some countries are rich and some others are poor. But in the world that he experienced, most likely the richest countries were four or five times as rich as the poorest ones. Since then, we have much greater inequalities. Why? And how can we try to close these gulfs? I think the best place to start is actually where an introductory course in economics, which you may have encountered in high school or you will encounter in a first year of a college degree. An economics course would start by describing an idealized situation. Markets that work, people can sell and buy goods, including their labor. Firms can enter into businesses. There are opportunities, secure property rights, and a sort of a background of a legal framework that people can make sure that if they enter into an economic relationship, they're not going to be duped. Unfortunately, those are ideal conditions. Most of humanity for its history has not lived under institutions of this sort. Neither do most people today. By institutions, I mean the rules of society, both formal and informal, how a market works, property rights, legal institutions, courts, opportunities. Those are parts of the institutions. When I enter into business with you, but we don't agree on everything and we have to go to court, those are institutions. The institutions that are the ideal ones of the textbook economic model, let me call them inclusive institutions. In particular, in inclusive institutions, markets and property rights are functioning. But even more importantly, and sometimes not as 
clearly emphasized in economics courses, is the idea that in inclusive institutions there are public services, education, roads, and other services provided by governments that make sure that markets function. It is on the basis of such arrangements, such institutions, that we think of the market economy working. Again, going back to Adam Smith, his celebrated idea, the invisible hand, that somehow markets are going to make sure that out of the selfish behavior of different players, something good is going to come out. Well, that really depends on that institutional setting. So at some level, economics has it right. Those sorts of institutions ensure that markets function, people can get into the professions that best suit their talents. The problem is that most of the institutions we have experienced in history don't look anything like that. Take the labor market. This is where most people make their living. They earn money, which then is used for paying all the other goods and services that they purchase. In economics textbooks and in functioning economies, again, such as South Korea, Western European ones, or the United States, we take it as given that people can go to work, choose what employer to work for, and get their money in return. But throughout history, most people did not have such options. Labor was intimately linked to coercion. People were either forced to work for an employer for wages that would not compensate for the effort and the disconvenience that they were suffering, or they were locked into a particular type of, of profession, for instance, as in the caste system in India today, or in the past, or the feudal systems that European countries had throughout most of their history. Those coercive labor relations are an example of a broader phenomenon. Institutions that do not provide such incentives or opportunities, and in fact, they are organized not to help people, but to extract resources from them for the benefit of a few influential parties. Once again, if you look at history, you can understand that quite clearly. Until 1994, South Africa was under a system known as apartheid. Less than 10% of the population who were white and of mixed race had certain rights that were not enjoyed by the majority black population, making up 90% of the country. The, in the apartheid system, blacks not only lacked political representation, they couldn't vote, but they also did not have economic rights. Many occupations were close to them. They were not allowed to open businesses. They were not even allowed to organize in workplaces to have their grievances voiced. The legal system was heavily biased against them. And of course, they did all the production but wealth was captured by a small minority of business and landowners, and especially mine owners. In other words, it was an extractive institution that empowered a small group, but did not create incentives, opportunities, or conditions for a fair living for the majority. The main idea of our book, Why Nations Fail, which is confirmed by historical and contemporary data, is that inclusive societies, those with inclusive institutions, are much better at deploying and enjoying the diverse skills of their population. Economic growth, especially economic growth based on new ideas, productivity improvements, innovation, and new technologies, is much more likely under inclusive economic institutions. But you should not think that extractive institutions are there by mistake. They are often designed because 
even though they do not maximize economic growth and prosperity for the population, they serve the people who are at the top of the hierarchy, such as the minority who benefited from the apartheid regime or the lords and seniors in the feudal European system. But economic institutions don't exist in a vacuum. The second main thesis of why nations fail is that you have to centrally understand how political institutions work and how they support economic institutions in order to get a better grasp of the prosperity and poverty of nations. To put it simply, extractive economic institutions of the fort that I've described in the context of apartheid would be very difficult to maintain if you had democracy in South Africa. Even if you could fool people some of the time, you couldn't fool them for so long that 90% majority would continuously vote for a system that kept them completely subservient. Their political participation would ultimately create a pathway towards a fairer set of rules in the economy, a better set of institutions or a more inclusive set of institutions. Hence, extractive economic institutions can only survive if there is a set of political institutions that support them. And what's the logic of such political institutions? From what I have described, it should be clear that just like the economic institutions that are extractive that monopolize economic resources and economic opportunities in the hands of a few people, extractive political institutions, those supporting extractive economic institutions, are going to be those that concentrate political power and political opportunity in the hands of a few people. Hence now, you see a synergistic relationship. You have inequities an extraction at the economic level if you have inequities and an unequal distribution of political power at the political level. The same is true when we turn to the polar opposite. So to support inclusive economic institutions, we therefore need a political system that is equally egalitarian in who has political power. And for parallel, with what I have described so far, James Robinson and I call these inclusive political institutions. Inclusive political institutions, most clearly captured by the ideal of democracy, are going to be much more at home with inclusive economic institutions, and conversely, inclusive economic institutions are much more likely to be supported by inclusive political institutions. But of course, these are polar extremes. No country is fully inclusive. No country is fully extractive. The United States, on the whole, can be viewed as an example of an inclusive society. But for most of its history, it was heavily discriminatory against its minority black American subpopulation. During certain periods of time, including today, the levels of inequality in the United States have reached astronomical proportions. South Korea itself is an example of an inclusive society, especially when compared to North Korea, which can be viewed as a quintessential example of an extractive society. The economy, including its coercive labor relations, lack of opportunities, lack of property rights, lack of market that allocate resources, are very typical of extractive institutions. And so is this political system that concentrates power in the hands of the military and a ruling family. But beyond that comparison, when you look at the details, South Korea is not a perfectly inclusive society. In the early stages of its development, it was under a uh, military dictatorship. And even after the military dictatorship was overthrown and the country became democratic, a lot of inequalities, for example, the role of very large companies continued. This underscores one of the ideas I'm going to return to in the second lecture, that building institutions is a dynamic process. No country has perfect institutions. No country can have perfect institutions because conditions change. So we have to understand how institutions can better themselves over time and in what ways they can collapse. But before I do that, 
I want to talk about one final topic. In emphasizing the role of inclusive economic institutions, I do not mean to suggest that economic growth is completely impossible under extractive economic institutions. There are examples in history of very rapid growth under extractive economic institutions. 19th century Prussia is one example where rapid industrialization took place despite the fact that the economy and politics was very unequal and dominated by a group of aristocrats. An even sharper example is Soviet Russia, which went through one of the fastest industrialization drives under Stalin for, that lasted 40 years. And today, we see China as the fastest growing country of the last 25 years or so, that has an economic system that is far from inclusive and a political system that is clearly extractive with the monopoly of power of the Communist Party. So how do we understand such growth experiences? I think the two most important ideas in this context is that growth under extractive economic institutions is different in nature than growth under inclusive institutions. The Soviet Russia, even though it poured resources into research and was able to make some advances in the space race, did not undergird its economy on rapid technological change. Most of the new technologies it used were imported from other countries. The same was true of the early stages of Prussian-German industrialization in the 19th century, and the same is true of China today. And that underscores the second point, that throughout history, inclusive economic institutions undergirding inclusive economic growth have proven much more sustainable, much more durable. Extractive economic growth under the auspices of extractive economic and political institutions tend to be more short-lived. The question, of course, moving into the 22nd century is whether China will be an exception to this rule or whether there are deep problems in the Chinese economic and political system that will start showing themselves in the decades to come. And these questions also relate to the dynamics of institutions, which is the topic I'm going to turn to in the next lecture. Thank you.